Habakkuk, this man who had a conversation with God, this man who looked at what was happening at his time in his community and in the nation, the southern nation of Judah, was looking and saying, hey, this is messed up. These things don't look good. There's violence. There's crime. There's people taking advantage of each other. There's injustice. There's all these things that are wrong that's going on. And I've been praying about them and wondering if God is going to do anything about this. This real honest, brutal conversation that he has with God and saying, look, I've been praying and, and, and all this is happening. How can you see this and how can you not do something about it? But as we've been looking at this, we realize that God answers and tells them, I am working, I am doing something, and judgment is coming. And he goes and explains that he's going to use the Babylonians, which was a very vicious and evil group of people, to bring justice to the situation, to bring judgment, and to deal with the evil that was happening. And even though Habakkuk complains and he's like, well, that's how you're going to deal with this? I mean, you're going to use this situation, these people, as evil as they are, that's what you're going to use? And he says, God, you are the holy God. You're my rock. You're pure. You are too pure, too holy. But God, after he answers him, Habakkuk takes this position that he basically says, your will be done. You are God. And even though I don't like the way you're going to deal with this, and even though I may not appreciate or understand why you're going to do this, I'm going to accept your answer to my prayer. I'm going to accept what you're going to do. And not only am I going to accept it, I'm going to stand on the wall. Remember we talked about that last week. I'm going to stand on the rampart. I'm just that, that image of, of a soldier who's standing on the wall looking out to see what is coming. You see, for us, we need to have that same kind of attitude. That no matter what circumstance we're going through, no matter how difficult it looks, no matter how odd the answer may be that comes our way, we just have to put our faith in God and accept that God is working things out. And that God in his time will answer the prayer and work things out. See, the position that Habakkuk took was one of total surrender. Total surrendering himself to God and saying, your will. You've heard my prayer. You've heard my complaint. You've heard what, I'm seeing, what I see is going on. And that's what you're going to do or how you're going to deal with it. Your will be done. Totally sold out and accepting what God is going to do and how God is going to do it. It's the same thing that Paul was telling us. You see, because too many times what we do is we look at our circumstances. We look at our situations. We look at what we can see and we hear, we can feel. We look at what is happening in our environment, what's happening in our families, in our community, and we start to make judgments and we start to, 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 to try to figure out how we're going to work that out, how we're going to answer that, how we're going to deal with that when we need to do what Paul said when he spoke in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. Walk by faith and not by sight. Total surrender. God, your will be done. Even though I don't understand it, even though I don't see how this is going to work out, even though I, 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 I want a certain outcome to come, I'm going to surrender all and just let you do what you're going to do. Because I know your will is perfect. Because your will is right. And at times it's difficult to do that. It's difficult for us to put our trust in the Lord. It's difficult, even though we've had experience in the past, something comes and it's challenging us and it, and it shakes our current situation, our current world, and it's hard for us to put our trust in God. But people put their trust in all kinds of things all the time. You look at people who put their trust in finances and they invest their money and they hope that the, the stock market is going to do well. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't, I'm not going to say, hey, you shouldn't do that. That's not what I'm saying. But what we're doing when we do those kinds of things is we are exercising a form of faith or trust. Because we're hoping that things are going to get better. We're hoping that there's going to be return to us. We're hoping that the outcome is going to be favorable on our part, even though at the moment when we're investing, we don't see it. 
We're just trusting it's going to be all right. And we do that in all ways in our lives. When we travel, we get into a car, we trust that our car is going to work right and take us from point A to point B. If you travel in an airplane, how many of you guys have a personal relationship with the pilot of that plane? (laughs) Most of us don't even see who the guy is or the gal. We don't know, right? We put our faith that we bought our ticket, that we know the itinerary, we know when we're going to get to the airport, when we're going to check in. We get into this steel tube, and we trust that the people who are on the ground have made sure there's enough fuel there, that the maintenance crew has done what they're supposed to do, that air traffic control has got all that worked out. We trust that the pilot knows that where we are and where we're supposed to go and that he knows how to get us there. And so what we do, we sit down, and we can't see anything Except we look out the window and see what's passing by. But we put our trust that we're going to get there. That's what God is asking us to do. To trust him. But in this case, we do have a personal relationship with Christ. If you've put your trust in God, if you've put your trust in Jesus, if you believe it in your heart and you confess it with your life that Jesus is Lord, and you've asked him to be your Savior and to be your Lord, then you do have a personal relationship. Even more so to trust him in what he is going to do. Putting our faith in God, putting our assurance in him, that no matter what happens, as we look out the window of life and things are flying by, we know where we're going because God is taking us there and we're following him. We're following him. Faith. It is what the writer of Hebrews spoke about. And in that chapter 11 where we know that, that he just spells out all the different people who had faith. And these people went through many things. And many of them uh, went through hardships and difficulties. And many of them, the promise that was given to them, they didn't even see come to fulfillment. But they trusted. Knowing that in the future at some point God was going to be faithful and answer. God was going to be true and faithful. That promises made were promises kept. That God was going to make it happen. Look at what verse 13 says. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a far distance. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Abraham was promised that he was going to be a father of many nations, that the descendants from him were as numerous as the stars. And I don't know if anyone has been able to yet count how many stars. Abraham didn't see that that fulfillment because there's still descendants of Abraham being born today. But it's a promise that God made to him. Many of the people who left Egypt were promised that they were going to go into a promised land. Many of them didn't make it, but God was faithful to his word. And he's faithful to you and to me. So we can put our trust in him and wait upon him. And he will answer. What a wonderful thought. What a wonderful picture for us. A reassurance for us as we read scripture. And we see the promises that were made centuries before coming to fulfillment. And it was God who made that happen. So the promises that are in the Bible for you and me. They're for sure. They will come to pass. Why? Because God said. And if God said it, God's going to do it. That's the faith that Habakkuk had. That's the faith that we see him displaying when the last time we looked at it, he just said, I'm just going to stand and wait to see what God is going to do. So that I can tell others when they ask. So I can be a spokesperson. So that I can share to the complaint. And then as we get into the next part of this chapter, in chapter 2, God starts to talk about these woes. He starts to share these woes with, the, with uh, Habakkuk because there was still a remnant of people that were there. Habakkuk was not just the only one. I believe there were others who were like him, were trusting in God, were waiting upon God, questioning but waiting upon God, just like the Israelites when they were in Egypt. God had promised that a Messiah was going to come. God had promised that there was going to be one who was going to come and free them and take them to the promised land. And Hundreds of years, they waited and waited, and finally, God answered that prayer. Some people waiting for that to happen did not see it, but others did. 
So there was a remnant that was waiting. And what we see here now in this chapter 2, we see God talking about these wolves. Now, let's first understand what the wolves are. And according to Webster's definition of a wolf, it is a condition of deep suffering from misfortune and affliction or grief. So the implication is that something has happened, something has, has gone wrong, and now there is an affliction. Now there is a, a suffering. Now there is pain. Now there is something that I'm having to deal with. But the implication of this misfortune is because of someone else. And that's true. Things happen in life because somebody else did something dumb. Somebody playing with fire and the house catches fire or the, the apartment complex catches fire or the forest catches fire. And the ramifications of that person's foolishness impacts many others. People drive recklessly on the road. They drive clearishly on the road and they cause an accident. And because of that person's decisions and actions, others now suffer because of that. And others now have a misfortune. Others now have an affliction. Others now have a woe. But generally speaking, when the Bible talks about woes, it talks about judgment that's coming. And it's talking about people in disobedience, people who are in sin. It's talking about something coming because of their deliberate decision and actions that they have taken. And throughout Scripture, we see where Israel again and again, after walking with God, decided to go a different way, and judgment came. And they would get right with God, and then they go away, and judgment came. You see, because God is going to deal with sin. God will deal with sin. So this cycle that we see here has happened throughout all history. The cycle of violence, of evil, of injustice. But there's always been a remnant who waited on God and was faithful, and God sustained them. So starting in verse 6, we start to see these woes, and here's the first one. God speaking says, Will not all of them taunt him and ridicule and scorn him, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? That they will become that you will become their prey. Because they have plundered many nations, the people who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood and have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. See, God was talking about thief, thieves, stealing, extortion. And God was not only talking about the nation, but also this judgment that was coming was for the Babylonians. And we see that later on. The same people that God used to bring judgment, also God was dealing with. Talking about stealing and extortion. So the picture I get here is, is this people ripping each other off, holding people up, breaking into the homes, taking what's not theirs. Kind of what we see on the evening news, where you see people going into the stores and just grabbing stuff and walking out. Where you hear people breaking into someone's house, people holding them up at gunpoint with some weapon, taking and stealing from them. Didn't God say, thou shalt not steal? And so God is saying, here's the wool. But there's also extortion. So today we can look at that as those White-collar crimes. People who are in a position of power, of influence, of authority, who manipulate the situation to be able to gain personally, who set up laws and policies and procedures so that they are the recipients of something they did not earn, but they extorted it. They stole it from somebody else. And God is saying, watch out. Those of you who are doing that, whoa. Then he goes into second one, starting in verse 9. He says, woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nests on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and fortifying your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Now, the second woe is similar to the first and that they're taking something that belongs to them. But this is more talking about a lifestyle, more talking about a, a behavior. It's talking about pride. It's talking about arrogance. It's talking about self-serving. It's talking about envy of jealousy. It's talking about those saying that I deserve better than you. 
And so I'm going to work the system so that I can improve and improve my status because I deserve it and you don't. It's talking about those who are making a system so that they can benefit while the others do not and they suffer. And God is saying, whoa, to those of you who do that. And we see that in our world today. We see that in businesses. We see that in our politicians. We see how they say we're going to spend millions or billions of dollars to help this. And then you find out that all the money was funneled to some account or was funneled to their friends or was funneled back to them. And the very purpose that they said they're going to help doesn't get any better. The people stay in the same situation. The the conditions don't get any better. And they're enriching themselves. They'll even say, well, we deserve to live in these parts of towns with walls and stuff protecting us because we deserve it. And you don't. And you live where you are, and they don't do anything to help those individuals out. And we see that it happens in our world. We see that in businesses. We see people in government, the politicians, and they do um, investigations. And you rub my back, I'll rub yours, and they hide stuff, and it's just ugly. But it's sad because that's even happening in the Christian community. That happens in religious circles. How many times have we seen the motivational speakers on TV, because that's what I call them, who are using the word of God, who are using the things of God for their own personal benefit, who try to justify the things that they have or that they need by using God's word and God's ways, who will claim that they need another airplane because, or they need more cars, or they need a larger house, or they need certain things in their lives and are taking it from the congregations that should, they should be serving. It happens all the time. In fact, in December, I read a story of this pastor who on one Sunday decided he was going to admonish the congregation and he was going to rebuke them because, see, he had requested a certain designer watch as a gift. And so when it came time to give him a gift, they gave him a watch that was not the one he asked for. It was one of, in his opinion, lesser value, lesser status. And so he decided that on Sunday he would let the congregation know their heir. And so his justification was, look, I am an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. I represent the king. And in such, I should have the finest things, I should have the finest clothing, I should find the finest jewelry, because after all, I am representing the kingdom of God. A lot of preachers, so-called preachers, believe that, teach that. I think they forgot that the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the great I am, came in the form of a babe in a manger. And that he lived the life So humble he didn't have any possessions, didn't he have a place to rest his head, didn't have a home, and he was the ultimate representative of heaven. Woe to those who practice those things. We should heed the words that Paul wrote. In Philippians chapter 2, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others Above yourselves, not looking for your own interests, but each of you to do the interest of others. And look at how Paul then tells us how we should act. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider himself equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. If anybody could have said, hey, I need the designer clothes. If anybody should have said, I need the best mansions, I need, the, I need to be carried. If anyone said, could have said that, it would have been the king of kings himself, right? Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he did what? Humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even to death on the cross. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to have that spirit, to have that desire, to have that position that that we're just your servants and we should be serving one another and seeking God's will and putting our faith in him and not being one that practices one of the woes that was being spoken of. 
chapter 2, verse 12 of Habakkuk, he starts talking about the third woe. And he says, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire? That the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What he's talking about here is people who were forcing others into labor. People who were using unfair scales. People who were using practices to to make others work for them. Talking about slavery. Talking about child labor. How many corporations are using child labor in other nations? And it happens in our cities when you talk about prostitution. When you talk about those evil things that are going on. Making themselves better than others or having more than others. God was saying, whoa. To those who practice those things. He continues in verse 15. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pouring it from the wineskins till they are drunk, so that they can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with the same with the shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and let the naked and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord is right. The cup is in the Lord's right hand, is coming around to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. People were using wine to get others drunk, to take advantage of them, to make them look foolish, using whatever substances they could to be able to take advantage of others and to mock them and to laugh at them. And how sad that we're in a society, especially with social media, where, where people will take videos of others who are under some kind of substance, either drugs or alcohol, and laugh at them and mock at them and just think it is so funny that somebody is in such a state of desperation that they're destroying themselves. That they're just taking themselves and putting themselves in such a bad state that others take advantage of them and others abuse them and others just do horrible things. And they laugh at it. And that was happening in those days. Verse 17 says, The violence you have done in Lebanon will overwhelm you, and and the destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. See, God was speaking to the Babylonians and says, Look at all those methods and all those things that you were using to destroy. That is going to come back on you. And the evil and the horror that you inflicted, worse than that is going to come back on you. And that's what you're going to deal with. God was talking to Habakkuk and letting him know he was going to be dealing with this. And the Babylonians were destroyed. If you go to Jeremiah chapter 51, you can read the story of how they were ultimately destroyed. And then he speaks of the last woe that we see here. And the last woe speaks about idolatry. It speaks about other gods and worshiping other images. In verse 18, it says, Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman? Or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes an idol that cannot speak. Woe to him Who says to the wood, come to life. Or to a lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver, yet there is no breath in it. They had images. They had these carvings of stone, of wood, of metal, of gold, of silver. That had eyes but couldn't see, ears but couldn't hear, mouths but couldn't speak, hands but couldn't do anything, feet couldn't walk. And they would put their trust in those things. And we still do that today. We put our trust in so many things that can't give us counsel, that can't give us guidance, that can't help us. And God is saying, woe to those who do that. What value is it that you've created this, that you've built this image in your life, that you've built this thing in your life that you are trusting in and hoping for it to help you, and it will not give you any help at all? Idolatry. Is what he was talking about. See, Habakkuk says judgment, or God tells Habakkuk, judgment is coming. All these behaviors, all these things that were happening, all these things that were being practiced, I am going to deal with those things because I am God. And I'm going to deal with sin. But the wonderful part about all this, because it looks bad, but the wonderful part about this for you and me is what we get to celebrate this morning. 
You see, on these tables, we're going to celebrate how God dealt with our sin, with our transgressions, with everything that was wrong in our lives. You see, the judgment that was coming to those people, God was going to deal with it. But for us, the judgment that our sin required, the punishment that we should have suffered, the guilt that we had and the shame that we had that had to be dealt with, we could not pay a price. But God dealt with it because he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to come and deal with that and to deal with the sin, to deal with Satan, to deal with the world, to deal with the lies so that you and I could have eternal life. That's the great news that we get as we look at this. So that all who believe in Jesus, all who put their faith in Jesus, all who believe in their heart and confess with their lips that Jesus is Lord, that judgment and that that punishment has passed on. Why? Because of what he did on the cross. Our guilt, our shame, our woes, our sin, nailed to the cross. He took it. He took it upon himself because only he, being the Lamb of God, could have done it. In exchange, he took all of the ugliness in our lives and gave us his righteousness. So now when God the Father looks at us, he doesn't see all the garbage He doesn't see all the woes. He doesn't see the turmoil. He doesn't see all the injustice. What he sees is his holy son that is in you and in me and in all who believe in him. Who came and took away the sins of the world. Didn't just postpone them. Didn't just cover them up. Took them away. And made us right with him again. Why? Because of faith. Because we put our faith in him. Because we put our faith in Jesus, the only one who made it possible. That's the great news for you and me today. That's the great news for all who are in this world and may look and see that, look, things are messed up. And they are. Things look ugly. And they do look ugly. There are problems. There are circumstances. There is injustice. There's all kinds of evil that is happening. But in the midst of all of that, we stand on faith. We stand on the Lord Jesus Christ. We wait for his answer. And God will deal with those things. I love the way the chapter ends. Simple verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent before him. That's like an exclamation point. That's like this is it. No matter what, God is on the throne. No matter what, God is in control. No matter how dark the hour looks, no matter how bad the situation looks, no matter how much suffering or grief, God is still on the throne and the whole earth will stand before him in silence. There is nothing that we can say, nothing that we can bring before him that would justify acting in a way contrary to what he would want us to do. Today, because of faith, we can come to these tables, and we will in a few moments. In a few moments, I'll ask our, the folks that I've spoken to to help to uh, pass out communion this morning. And when you come to the table this morning, we will celebrate with bread and with juice. And the bread is what represents his body that took all the punishment and judgment and all the things that we deserve was put on Jesus. And the juice that we drink represents his blood. It represents his innocent blood that was shed to wash away the sins of the world. Today, if you don't know Jesus, today's your day. You may not understand it, but God has been chasing you your whole life. In your darkest hour, no matter what's been going on, God has been there the whole time. And God wants to tell you, look at all the violence, all the ugliness, all the crime, all the injustice, all those things that are happening in your life. Give them to me. Because I've already dealt with it on the cross. And I'll take that from you and I'm going to give you peace and I'm going to give you life and I'm going to give you joy. In the middle of everything that's going on, you will have joy. Why? Because of your faith in him. That blessed assurance that no matter what, you're standing on the wall, trusting on him and his will be done. If you don't know Jesus today as we do this, as we celebrate communion, come and let us know. One of us that will be up here would love to pray with you. 
Maybe you've drifted off. God is calling you. He hasn't given up. We give up. God hasn't. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And he wants you to be in that relationship with him. Like I said, you can get into a plane and not have a relationship with the pilot, and you trust that you're going to get where you're supposed to get to. But in life, trust in the Lord. Trust in Jesus. Why? Because you put your faith in him, and his promises never fail. Amen? Amen. Join me as we pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this time. And now, Lord, as we transition from the message to a time of communion, Father, I pray that that our hearts would be ready, that we understand that this is a very sacred and important moment. It's not just an item to check off the box and say, hey, I did that, and feel good about it. It's to sincerely examine ourselves and realize that, Lord, if it hadn't been for you coming and living a perfect life, And at the time of your choosing, allow yourself to be crucified, to be nailed on that cross, to take the wrath and the judgment that we deserve upon yourself, to then be put in a tomb and rise so that, Lord, once and for all, sin, Satan, the world, the lies, all of it would have been dealt with because of you, because of your love for us. Lord, if there's one today who doesn't know you, I pray that today would be the day. That even though they don't understand it, that something has happened in their mind and in their heart. And that they're not here by a mistake. They're not here because it was some circumstance or some chance. They're here because, Lord, you brought them here to hear your word. To be around your people. To hear that there is hope, that there is an answer. That yes, life is difficult, and yes, we're going to go through things, but you, Jesus, you told us not to worry because you've already overcome the world. You told us we're going to have hardships. You told us we're going to have a hard time. There's going to be dark days. There's going to be times of sorrow, of grief, of disappointment, of frustration. But in the midst of all that, your light shines bright because you have our future in your hands. We're in this world, but we're not of it. And someday soon, Lord, you will call us home. Either our life here will end and we will step into eternity, or that trumpet's going to sound, the sky is going to crack open, and we are going to see you face to face. Whichever way you choose, Lord, your will be done. Father, we thank you for this time. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.